evening everybody thanks for attending this uh, public lecture um, i'm john griffin at swansea university and uh, we are hosting the british phycological meeting this year it's the 70th annual meeting of the british phycological society it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, dr dan smale and professor pippa moore this evening um, for their talk on um, kelp forests and their responses to global change and um, just to in, by way of introduction to these uh, really ins inspirational researchers um, Dr Dan Smale is a group leader at the Marine Biological Association in Plymouth and he's a U UKRI um, future leader although some might argue already a current leader in his field um, and Pippa Moore is a professor at um, Newcastle University specialising in marine ecology. As you're going to learn during this um, lecture, they're both world leaders in marine ecology with particular focus, which they'll be um, revealing today on kelp forests, of course. And they've over the last 10 years, um, after UK kelp forests in particular were really overlooked for, for several decades. In, in fact, from the 1970s all the way through to the, the 2010s, very little research was being done on these, these incredible ecosystems around our coastline. And um, Dan and Pippa got together and really formed what they call, um, is it Team Kelp or Team Kelp UK? And their collaborative research along with their um, research groups has, have really helped to to, to reveal so much about these systems, which hopefully we're going to be learning a lot more about tonight. So without further ado, I'll pass over um, to Dan and Pip and um, I'll leave you all to enjoy their talk. Thank you, John. That's a very kind introduction. Um, yeah, as John said, Pip and I are going to give sort of double acts, uh, tag team, good cop, bad cop kind of talk today. Um, because a lot of the work we're going to present has been done in collaboration um, on various projects since we started working together in about 2014. Uh, on behalf of Pip and myself, I'd just like to thank John and Geordie and the rest of the organising committee for inviting us to give the public lecture at this year's um, BPS meeting. Hopefully next year we'll all be in person. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to give a brief overview of the importance of kelp forests and talk about impacts of ocean warming before handing over to Pip, who's gonna talk about the role of kelp in blue carbon and approaches to restoration. So for any non-specialists out there, very briefly, what actually is kelp? Well, um, taxonomically speaking, uh, there's a strict definition of species that belong to the order laminarials, but us ecologists tend to use a broader definition that includes other large brown canopy forming seaweeds from other taxonomic groups as well. They tend to have a biphasic life cycle with a microscopic gametophyte stage, which you can barely see with the naked eye, but then this, this macroscopic sporophyte or plant-like phase, um, which I guess we're more familiar with, perhaps mostly um, washed up as rack on beaches uh, after heavy storms. And so often get, we often get asked why we spend our lives thinking about kelp. Well, first of all, um, they're geographically very widespread. Kelp species are predicted to inhabit up to a third of the world's coastlines, and they're particularly abundant uh, in um, temperate regions and polar regions, but are also found in warmer waters and also on deeper reefs. And some kelp species are amongst the fastest growing primary producers on Earth, and this provides this biomass provides fuel for inshore food webs both directly for grazers um, like blue ray limpets and sea urchins, but the vast majority of kelp production is actually um, processed as detritus through the detrital, detrital food web. And just like trees on land, kelps are foundation species. So they provide habitat for lots of associated organisms and they alter environmental conditions. And that in turn elevates local levels of biodiversity. And in terms of direct habitat provision, um, each of the different sort of components, structures of the kelp plant uh, offers a different microhabitat. So these images just show pictures of holdfasts from different kelp species uh, around the world, just to give you an idea of the variability. But in general, these holdfasts provide very high quality habitat for lots of associated invertebrates, particularly um, in the sort of interstitial spaces between these root-like structures, the haptera. And then you have the stipe or, or stem-like structure, which 
offers a large area for colonization um, by um, other seaweeds like these red algae or also um, sessile encrusting animals like these sponges here. This is a, a laminaria hyperbrea stipe in, in Scotland. And then you have lots of kelp plants together. Uh, you have a kelp forest or a stand. Uh, and this, is, this can be really um, high quality and very extensive habitat. Uh, just a quick shout out to Richard Chucksmith, who's a photographer up in Shetland, uh, who kindly gave us permission to use some of his amazing, amazing images um, in this talk. Uh, and here's another one just looking over the kelp canopy, just to show um, how extensive these habitats can be. Work from some of the work we've done um, has shown that a single holdfast can support more than 50 different species, so they can be really rich. And work from Norway showed that a single kelp plant can support more than 80,000 individuals. And we're talking mostly about sort of like tiny, small crustaceans like amphipods and isopods, also sort of gastropods and echinoderms. And these little invertebrates, these critters are really um, useful, valuable fish food. So in, in turn, kelp forests are critical foraging and nursery habitats for these higher organisms like fish, shellfish, mammals and birds. And just to show that again with these images, um, you can see lots of juvenile fish using these kelp forests for nursery. And yeah, some of the sort of cute and cuddlies coming in to use it as foraging habitat as well. As, as well as a really important habitat provision, these kelp forests offer other ecosystem services like coastal defense, nutrient cycling and blue carbon, which Pip's gonna talk about uh, in a short while. So we know that there are key drivers or, or factors that influence the distribution of kelp species globally and also shape the structure of these, these kelp forests. And these uh, include temperature, uh, exposure to waves and storms, light availability, which in turn is related to water depth and water clarity, uh, the availability of suitable rocky substrate, so like rocky seabed, uh, and then other factors can also be important um, sort of locally. And you can chuck all of these um, factors uh, into models and you can predict the distribution, biomass and abundance of kelp species and habitats uh, in any given particular region. And I just wanted to focus on one of these key drivers, which is temperature. And temperature isn't just a, a key driver for, for kelps, it's, it's really important um, in determining the distribution and, and, and ecological performance of all marine organisms in the sea, uh, because temperature is a critical factor that affects biological processes. And we know that temperature, uh, temperatures are changing uh, because of the consequences of anthropogenic um, global heating. So atmospheric CO2 concentrations are now at 417 parts per million, and the five hottest years on record have occurred since 2015. And even after the recent COP26 meeting in Glasgow and the outcomes from that, the most recent projections suggest that we're still on course for two to 3.6 degrees of warming by the end of the century, um, which is obviously well past the safe limit of 1.5 degrees of warming relative to pre-industrial levels. So the good news is that things would be a lot, lot worse if it wasn't for the global ocean. Uh, the sea is an incredible um, sponge for, for heat and energy. Uh, and about 90% of the excess heat trapped in the atmosphere has been soaked up by the global ocean. But the downside to that is that the global ocean has then warmed significantly over the past century um, with rapid warming over the last few decades. And this map just shows um, the coastal waters around the globe. Uh, and shows the, the colors indicate the, the rate of change of sea temperatures where um, red indicates warming over the last few decades. And as you can see, most of the coast, global coastline uh, has, has warmed in recent years. And as I said, temperature is such a key factor that that has a lot of influence on biological processes. And we've seen lots of ecological responses to these warming trends. And the, yeah, these responses uh, include species range shifts. So the geographical distribution of species uh, may move, particularly latitudinal distributions move poleward um, to keep these species within thermally favorable habitat. Uh, we've seen habitat and biodiversity loss. I should say that in some regions we've also seen biodiversity gain because ocean warming creates winners and losers. Um, there's been coral bleaching and mortality quite extensively uh, and mass mortality events of, of fit, finfish and shellfish 
spread of invasive species and an increased occurrence of harmful algal blooms and disease have all been uh, associated with recent ocean warming trends. And as well as long-term increases in average ocean temperature, we've also seen an increase in the occurrence of extreme warming events or marine heat waves. So just like we experience on land, we experience atmospheric heat waves where the air temperatures get much hotter than you'd expect for that time or that place, these events also happen in the sea. And so marine heat waves are discrete periods of enormously high water temperatures for any given place or season. And a little while ago, we came, a little while back, um, we came up with our group, our network came up with a definition for marine heat waves. So you can actually describe specific events. And once you have an empirical definition, you can then look at trends in marine heat waves uh, over time. And so we did this and showed that um, from 1925 to 2016, so like uh, almost a, a century period, on, on average, global marine heat wave frequency increased by 34% and the duration increased by 17%. So marine heat waves are occurring more frequently, more often, and they're also on average longer. And you combine those two things and you get a 54% increase in annual marine heat wave days globally. So put simply, what that means is if you're a population of seaweeds or fish or coral in any place in the ocean, it's far more likely that you're going to experience um, extremely hot temperatures now than it was, say, 100 years ago. And once we have this definition, we started looking at um, specific marine heat wave events that have occurred in recent years and found that a lot of them were associated with really quite significant biological impacts. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these just to give you an idea, but for example, uh, Mediterranean heat wave in 2003 uh, led to really widespread mass mortalities of marine invertebrates, things like soft corals that provide habitat for other species. Uh, in um, the Northeast Pacific, more recently, uh, a, a long duration, very extensive heat wave was coined the blob developed a couple of years back, and that had widespread ecosystem impacts, um, causing low ocean, ocean productivity and mass mortality of mammals and birds. And also there was a, a, a marine heat wave in the Northwest Pacific, uh, sorry, Northwest Atlantic uh, in 2012, which caused ma major disruption to fisheries, uh, particularly the lobster fishery. And just going back to kelp, so whether it's these long-term decadal um, increases in temperature, these warming trends, or whether it's an increase in short-term extreme events, these marine heat waves, there have been lots of reports of changes in kelp um, species distribution and changes in the forest that they create uh, in relation to, to warming. Uh, and I'm just going to focus on three of these as examples. First of all, um, Eclonia radiata in the southwest, which is a kelp that is, uh, is very extensive in Australia, uh, particularly in the southwest of Australia. Uh, Eclonia carver, which forms mixed beds with sargassum species in Japan, and then mixed laminaria beds uh, closer to home. So in 2011, uh, the west coast of Australia experienced its highest magnitude warming event on record. Uh, this marine heat wave developed uh, and became really extreme in every way. So uh, sea temperatures were the highest on record ever recorded, whether looking at the short term satellite derived sea surface temperature data set or longer reconstructed temperatures. It was the hottest temperatures on record. And this heat wave affected over 2000 kilometers of coastline persisted for eight to 10 weeks, and sea temperatures were up to five degrees higher than average. And this, this event happened in summer when temperatures were already high. And there were lots and lots of uh, ecosystem impacts of this really extreme event. I was working uh, with Thomas Wernberg at the time at UWA, and he had some really good baseline data of the colonial radiata kelp forests um, along this, this coast of Southwest Australia. And before the heat wave, um, this cold adapted kelp stretched all the way up to sort of 28 degrees south uh, at this place called Calvary. But following the heat wave, we did lots of different surveys and showed that the colonia radiata was eradicated from around 100 kilometers of coastline. So this habitat retracted around 100 kilometers, um, actually within, within a few months of the marine heat wave. And then following that, we showed that um, up to 43% of forests along this coast were lost or severely decimated which led to an estimated total area of loss of around 1,000 square kilometers. And in almost all cases, you've got a shift from this 
structurally diverse um, and biologically diverse kelp forest towards a simple unstructured algal turf um, with just turf forming algae on most, most reefs. Just to show that in more detail, this is a picture of a colonial radiata towards its range edge before the marine heat wave. And then this is the same reef uh, just a few months after, and it, it, it turned into this sort of silty degraded habitat with much smaller uh, turf forming weeds and some other seaweeds amongst it. We didn't just look at the kelps, we also looked at other components of the ecosystem. So we surveyed mobile invertebrates, corals, seaweeds and fish. Uh, and across the board, we showed that species with um, a warm water or tropical um, affinity, so these are shown in red in these graphs, they tended to increase in abundance after the heat wave. Whereas species with a more temperate or cold water affinity tended to decrease in abundance. And that was kind of seen across the board. So when you put all this together, you have a really rapid ecosystem level reconfiguration. And so, yeah, the extreme warming event altered the structure of an entire temperate ecosystem, causing a really rapid phase shift towards a more tropicalized state. And since then, there's been very limited or no recovery of the kelp forest um, and more and more coral recruitment, which does again point towards tropicalization. The second case study comes from Japan. And as I think Jason mentioned yesterday, this area of Japan has warmed quite rapidly over recent decades due to a strengthening of the main current and background um, ocean warming. And interestingly in Japan, they have this phrase isayake, which the fishermen have used for centuries, which refers to a period when algal forests um, aren't as uh, extensive as they should be or they used to be. And this is important because the fishermen know that catches of certain species like abalone will likely be um, lower during these periods. And amazingly, they've got this historic record of the different districts around Japan and how many Isayaki periods were recorded in the early 20th century, the mid 20th century and the early 21st century. And you can see these black um, regions indicate areas where they've lost algal forest and they've increased uh, over a century. And basically what's happened is that warming has had a direct physiological impact on cold adapted kelps fucoids. Uh, so they've declined in abundance and become locally extinct in some cases. And there's been partial replacement by warm adapted species, particularly the sargassum species. Uh, there's been increased herbivory by tropical fish and urchins, which suppressed recovery. And overall, there's been a shift from algal forests to really sparse beds, encrusting algae and coral. And overall, the estimate is that several thousand hectares of algal beds have been lost, with implications for both fisheries and biodiversity conservation. I think these, this series of images shows it um, really powerfully. So this is the same region over sort of 20 years or so. And in the early 90s, these temperate reefs were dominated by very high coverage of a colonial carver, which became more sparse over time due to the direct impacts of warming and also um, increased um, herbivory grazing. And they were replaced by grazer resistant encrusting coralline algae, and then more recently, some warm adapted um, corals. So I think that's a really good example of how warming can drive such a rapid tropicalization from temperate to warm state. Okay, the third case study comes from closer to home, the kelp forests in UK and Ireland. Um, we have a really interesting system where we have the coexistence of seven different kelp species, all of which can be locally abundant under different environmental conditions. But sort of four of them have a, a more northerly or cold distribution, cold tolerance, uh, whereas three of them have a more warm uh, southerly distribution or more cosmopolitan and weedy distribution. And so with the recent warming trends, you could predict that some of these cold adapted species would decline, particularly towards their range edge. And some of these uh, warm or opportunistic species may increase in abundance uh, in response to warming. So I'm just going to focus on two of these, which are uh, uh, two of these, um, which tend to be dominant on sort of shallow subtidal reefs uh, under different wave exposure conditions, but they do coexist in semi sheltered sites. So the warm adapted species Lamidaria ocreluca is distributed from Morocco in the Mediterranean up to the southwest of the UK, although in fact there's a, a, a population that's recently been described in Ireland. And it was first recorded in the UK in 1948 by Mary Park, uh, who got a nature paper out of it, uh, and she was based at the MBA at the time. And there's anecdotal evidence to suggest that there's been a rapid increase in the abundance of this warm adapted species around the southwest coast of the UK. 
So we wanted to know if laminaria ocreluca is proliferating at the polewood range edge, and if so, so what? Should we really care? Does it have any community or ecosystem level impacts? And this was part of Harry Teagle's PhD a few years ago. He was able to find some uh, historical data, survey data from Lundy, Plymouth Sound and the Sillies, and look at the relative abundance of this cold adapted assemblage dominant laminaria hyperborea versus um, this warm uh, extending species laminaria ocreluca. And over time showed that across the board, there has been an increase in the relative abundance of the warm adapted species, which does suggest uh, that it is proliferating at the range edge. So, okay, the first question was, how does this um, affect local biodiversity? So we sampled stipe assemblages uh, hosted by these two different foundation species. Uh, and as I said earlier, laminaria hyperborea tends to have this rich stipe assemblage of red algae and sponges and other encrusting stuff. Whereas um, ocreluca tends to be totally devoid of any epibionts on the stipes. And so we sampled lots of kelps, of two different species, two different sites, two different seasons and consistently found that this cold adapted species supports much greater richness and much greater biomass and very distinct communities. We then went on to look at the critters living in amongst those sessile organisms, uh, sessile um, stipe assemblages, sorry. Uh, so now we're looking at mobile um, invertebrate assemblages and a number of different sites. We measured uh, the total abundance and the total richness and compared across the two species. And again, consistently, the cold adapted foundation species supports much greater abundance and richness. And in fact, across the study, around 50 times fewer mobile invertebrates are supported by this warm water kelp and their communities are very, very different. And as these are important uh, organisms for trophic food webs, for food webs, um, maybe that'll have implications uh, going forward. Finally, we looked at the growth, uh, growth and consumption of these two different species. And um, this was part of Albert Pesaradonna's work when he was at the MBA a couple of years ago. And he measured um, growth rates of these two different species every month across two different sites. And we've known for many years since the pioneering work of Joanna Kane and others that hyperborea tends to increase its growth rates from winter into spring and then drops off markedly and to almost no growth for the rest of the year. Albert showed that at the same place, Ocreluca increases its growth into summer and maintains some productivity all year round. So very different patterns. And we did some surveys and some feeding experiments and showed that this warm adapted species is much preferred as a food source for grazers. It's faster, it's more readily consumed and you get higher densities on the warm adapted kelp. And we also did some litter bag experiments in the field and showed that this warm water kelp decomposes more quickly than the cold water um, congener. And so, yeah, just to summarize, the overall effects of warming in the UK here are perhaps not as dramatic as what we've seen or others have seen in Australia and Japan, but these subtle changes uh, may be important going forward. So UK kelp forest today, Laminaria hyperborea provides habitat for a wide range of species, um, high richness in biomass, clear seasonality and growth and detritus production, and its biomass is less readily consumed and turned over. And where we have sites where ocreluca is increasing, so these semi-sheltered, semi-wave exposed sites where ocreluca is doing well, we have this loss of this habitat cascade and reduced richness in biomass. Changes in the timing and growth of the timing of growth and detritus release and a much quicker turnover of biomass. And the next step is to really see whether there are wider ecosystem consequences, but it's a really uh, interesting case study of a, a climate-driven substitution of a foundation species. Oh, so that's the end of my half, which was a bit doom and gloom, but Pip's gonna come in hopefully with some optimism, uh, and then we'll have time for a, a Q and A at the end. Pip, are you there? <laughs> Sorry, I've I'd, I'd lost Zoom as a choice. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you and see your presentation. Yeah, perfect. Cool. Okay, but you can't see me. Oh no! No. Why not? <laughs> I don't know. Start video. <laughs> that perhaps wasn't as, as as smooth as it perhaps should have been. Oh. Um, but um, yeah, Dan's just given a really nice overview of um sort of the structure. Um, of kelp forests and how they um, support high levels of biodiversity um, and really important for um, you know, ecosystem functioning. 
Um, and, and as Dan sort of said, his, his story was a little bit more on the doom and gloom and the, the um, sort of uh, the, the negative impacts that warming is having on a, a wide range of kelp forests. But there's also, as with any um, natural system, a wide range of other stresses that are all interacting. So while my, my next slide um, is a bit negative, um, hopefully after this we turn into a more positive um, uh, uh, mood that's the second half. So um, as Dan said, kelp forests are in decline and he gave um, three um, examples, um, but this is um, a, a figure out of one of Thomas Wernberg's papers um, showing um, where there's um, positive um, increases in kelp forests, um, negative declines and, and no change. And you can see that there's a mixed bag around much of the globe um, but they're certainly um, seeing declines in kelp forest, forest at a regional scale. We're actually quite fortunate um, in the United Kingdom is that we're sort of the honeypot for um, kelp forests in many respects. And, and actually, um, you know, if you dive around um, many locations around the United Kingdom, our kelp forests are actually very extensive and, and very healthy and an absolute, um, you know, I'd much rather dive in a, in a temperate kelp forest than a coral reef. Um, and coral reefs prefer me to dive in temperate forests as well. Um, we do have some localised um, declines in kelp forests, so some of you might be very familiar with the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project. Um, so um, they uh, had extensive kelp beds um, up to the, about the 1980s, um, and perhaps the, the drivers of what led to their decline are still somewhat um, uh, unknown, but anecdotally it's felt that um, a, a, a large storm event um, followed by a um, trawling has limited the recovery of that forest. So now the kelp forest extent is much less um, in the area. And some of you may have heard in the news or, or seen elsewhere that a uh, local, lo local fisheries bylaw was implemented this year that is to stop um, benthic trawling within um, three nautical miles of this area in the hope that um, this will not only lead to the recovery of kelp forests, but also wider biodiversity as well. Um, there are also other localised areas where um, perhaps there's been high levels of in industrial activity. Um, so the Durham coastline, for instance, um, quite a lot of co coal spoil waste was dumped directly onto the beaches. Some of you may actually be familiar with this beach um, if you've actually watched the 1970s film um, Get Carter with Michael Payne and um, where they had a dramatic scene on uh, Easington Beach, which is in this picture. And over the last sort of um, 10 or, or 20 years, millions of pounds have gone into um, actually um, removing a lot of this pollution and, and restoring these coastlines. Um, Harry Catherall, who, who had a poster yesterday um, and is a PhD student in my lab, he's doing some work with the Durham Heritage Coast um, on uh, looking at um, how the kelp forests in these sort of degraded areas differ from more healthy areas and also looking at restoration in these systems. So where kelp, kelp forests are in decline, um, you can have sort of passive approaches where you just let nature take its course, but sometimes you actually might have to make more active interventions um, and look at um, restoring these um, environments. So um, there's been a fair amount of interest in, in the last um, probably decade on kelp forest restoration and perhaps um, kelp forest restoration is somewhat behind the work that's being done on corals, seagrass um, and salt marshes, for instance, and mangroves as well. Um, but the term re restoration is the process of initiating and accelerating the recovery of an ecosystem that's been degraded or destroyed. So we're seeing more and more work done in this area. Some of you may have been in Hannah Earp's talk earlier today where she went into this in much more detail. Um, but as part of Hannah's um, PhD, she undertook a global meta-analysis looking at the different restoration techniques um, and their success. So I'm just gonna show a few slides um, that some of you might have seen earlier today, but those of you were, who weren't in that talk um, might find these useful. So um, for those of you that aren't familiar with meta-analyses, um, they're very common in um, the sort of medical literature um, where you might only have small groups of humans on trials. So you don't have a lot of um, statistical power to show whether um, the efficacy of that drug or not. So what you quite often do is you combine drug trials from around the world to increase that statistical power. 
And we can do the same um, in, in sort of eco or, or any um, scientific study is that what you can do is you can do a, a broad literature search for um, information in the area that you're interested in. You get those papers, you read them and you extract data from those papers. So um, Hannah did this literature review, all of these individual dots, uh, locations where restoration activity has taken place. Um, if you think back to the map that um, Dan showed um, uh, in his first or second slide, um, the sort of distribution of kelp is along these sort of seaboards, along the Europe temperate um, northern and southern hemisphere. So what we can see is that a lot of work is centered around um, the sort of California coastline, um, a lot of work in the Mediterranean um, on, on Cystocyra, which is a fucoid, um, and a lot of work, um, particularly in Southeast Australia um, and some in Western Australia in part in response um, to the marine heat wave that um, Dan discussed, and also some work um, in, in Chile. But you can also see that there's actually quite a lot of gaps um, in that work as well. So I'm going to take you through a couple of the, the, the meta-analysis figures. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with interpreting meta-analyses, because you're taking studies um, from lots of different places that have done different methodologies and, and, and things like that, is that you need to put them into a, a I guess it'd be equivalent to standardizing them um, so that you can actually make direct comparisons between each of these studies. So as a function of this, you calculate um, a, 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 a metric. Um, in this case, we used Hedges G. Don't worry too much about that. Um, the important thing is, is um, values above zero suggest a positive effect. Values below zero suggest a negative effect. And, and, and if they cross zero, then um, there's no, no difference. In the terms of our meta-analysis, is if there's a positive effect, this means there's a, um, a, a successful restoration. That restoration is actually doing better than a unmanipulated control. If it's a negative effect, it suggests that the restoration effort is not doing as well as an unmanipulated unmanip control. So say if we were looking at mortality, um, more, more, kelp, more kelp that had been um, restored is dying than the, um, in an unmanipulated un area. In the case of our work, if, um, in terms of restoration, you're comparing um, uh, a control with a restored area. If it's an insignificant result, we can still interpret that as a restoration success because it's doing as well as the unmanipulated control. So here we've got some of the results from um, um, Hannah's work. Um, what we've got here on, on the y-axis is different restoration techniques and, and the images below here give some examples of that. So artificial, what we're talking about is um, sort of seeding on artificial structures like these Dolos breakwater um, um, te tetrapods. Um, we've got competitor exclusion and herbivore exclusion. So in, in this case, this is a, a bubble curtain, um, which is, seeks to um, uh, deter herbivores from the area. We've also got seeding. So in, in this context, what we're doing is that we're, we're taking um, reproductive um, uh, plants, um, we're putting them into a, a receptacle and placing them in the environment in, in the, the anticipation that the spores will be released and then settle on the substrate. And then finally, what we've got here is an image where um, the, the researcher is actively um, taken um, an adult plant from an area and then placed it um, in the area that needs to be restored. In this case, they've used um, plastic netting um, and, and bolts to it, affix it to the substrate. So Hannah looked at two response variables. She looked at um, abundance and she also looked at morphology. This one is abundance. Um, the numbers above each of the, um, of, of the, the uh, in, uh, figures um, are the number of observations, so the number of studies. And what we can see is across all of, all of these different um, uh, techniques is that there's either a, um, a neutral effect, so the, the kelp abundance is the same as the control, or indeed actually the re restored kelp is doing better in terms of um, abundance than um, the control condition. Perhaps not as clear cut, um, but again, we can see when you're looking at changes in morphology, so this could be um, uh, 
uh, kelp length, it could be um, whole fast diameter, um, for instance, as the response variables, is that you can see again that for most of the studies, they either do as well as the control, and in a few cases, they do better. So looking at this work here, um, we can sort of say that um, kelp forest restoration techniques, or, or most of the techniques that have been tested, can actually um, result in success. And in some case, cases, these um, restored systems, um, at least in the short term over, wi over which they've been studied, are doing um, as well as unmanipulated controls. The one problem that we've got here is that most of these studies are done at an experimental scale. Um, and the next stage in sort of kelp forest restoration is really to scale this, uh, these approaches up um, and, and, uh, and, and show that you can do this at the large scale, like people have shown with seagrass restoration and oyster restoration, particularly in the United States. But um, what I do want to do is I actually want to give um, tell you a story about what I think has been a very successful kelp restoration um, activity. And that, that was undertaken in Sydney um, in, in, in Australia. Um, and so they've got a, 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 an algal, which they call crayweed. Um, and that species um, uh, is found along the, the eastern seaboard of, of New South Wales. Um, and during the 1980s, um, it disappeared um, from the Sydney metropolitan area. Um, my, my accent probably doesn't give you any hints these days, but I actually grew up in Australia um, on Sydney Harbour. Um, and I spent quite a lot of time um, swimming um, in the harbour beaches of Sydney. Um, and the reason that, the, that it's believed that this species disappeared is it doesn't tolerate high levels of nutrients. Um, and as a swimmer in Sydney Harbour at that time, I can tell you that there was an awful lot of nutrient input because quite often you would be swimming around and suddenly having to dodge um, a log that wasn't of the wood variety, because um, at that point in time, all sewage was actually um, uh, uh, released directly into Sydney Harbour. And it wasn't until the 1990s that actually pipes took it to three miles um, offshore and, um, and, and the sewage is now released at, at, at a couple of hundred metres depth. So Sydney Harbour, for all its beauty, was quite polluted at that time. Um, so in, in the sort of, um, well, probably 2010, really, is, is that they looked um, to actually see if they could restore um, this seaweed to Sydney Harbour. It's called crayweed um, because it's um, shown to support more crayfish um, than lots of other marine vegetated habitats. You can see a cuttlefish here. Um, it's also shown to support um, a, a wide range of fisheries. Um, and so what they did is they tested a technique at a small scale where they um, took um, individuals from um, locations north and south of the Sydney metropolitan area where healthy populations were found. They then affixed them um, to, to plastic matting um, and then um, put them onto the, the coastline. Um, and what they first off showed is what we've got here is we've got um, an we've got survival here and time along here. The first line is unmanipulated individuals. So those were from um, the source populations. No one had touched those. We've got then what we got a sort of a, a treatment control. So these were removed from um, the source area and then placed back in the source area. And then we've got two that um, um, locations where individuals were transplanted from these source locations to two locations in the Sydney metropolitan area. And what we can see is we can see the percentage survival. Um, and if after 25 weeks, the level of survival was no different across all of those treatments. So it's suggesting that the, the, the transplant process, the levels of mortality were no different to the levels of mortality that were experienced um, where, where the, the, the weed was not um, manipulated. What they actually noticed is um, when they, they noticed what they called crabies, which are these little um, juvenile um, seaweeds here. And what they found is where you had actually translocated um, individuals is on the edge of these and, on, and, and, and inside the, the transplanted location, recruit density was much higher at these reference sites where um, transplantation had not taken place. And what the researchers um, suggested 
is that the stress involved in transplantation um, had meant that actually this seaweed had reallocated its energy um, to reproduction. And lots of organisms do that. You know, you're quite often suggested if your pot plant isn't flowering to, to um, reduce watering it, to create a bit of stress, I'm about to die, let's reproduce. Um, and so as a function of this, what you found is that um, these crabies became established and grew up. And indeed, within about 18 months of um, these transplants taking place, the, the transplanted individuals um, had, uh, had, had died. Um, and then they were able to remove this plastic matting. So there was um, no plastic left in the marine environment. And these cray, cray, the cray babies grew up to become forests. So this was a really interesting study. They started off with just researchers doing small scale transplantations. They then roped in the university dive club to scale that up a little bit more. Um, and then they've worked with the community and a, a large group of um, um, volunteers to help scale up this research. So from um, establishing 24 meters squared in the first instance, they've now established 4,000 meters squared of this um, healthy cray cray weed populations across approximately five me 500 metres of coastline um, in six years. And they've estimated that costs about 46,000 pounds per a dollars, US dollars per, per hectare. So we can restore these environments and, and, and not, you know, notwithstanding all the biodiversity value of these, um, these kelp forests, there's also other reasons that we might actually want to um, not only protect existing um, kelp forests, but also to restore um, areas that have been degraded. And that is because of the potential um, carbon um, sequestration of these environments. So for those of you that aren't familiar, um, carbon is often described in, in colour. So brown carbon um, is the greenhouse gas emissions, um, such as CO2 and methane. Black carbon is um, emissions as a result of imperfect combustion, so um, things like soot and dust. Green carbon is the carbon that's stored in terrestrial vegetation and soils. Um, and then blue carbon is probably um, the last color on, on the street. And this is the carbon stored in marine vegetated habitats and sediments. And really, um, blue carbon is, is the poorer cousin um, of green carbon. It's only been really in the last ooh, 15 years or so that people really started talking about it. And the focus has very much been on mangroves, seagrass meadows and salt marshes. And there's good reason for that. Um, all of these three environments um, are established on, on soft sediments. Um, they're highly productive. Um, and not only do, do the, the, the um, carbon that they um, produce via um, biomass um, creation and loss become sequestered within the sediments, but they also are very good at catching alochthonous sources that might have come um, from riverine systems or from other areas. Kelp forests um, have historically not been considered as blue carbon habitat, um, and, and that's primarily because they, 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 they establish on, on rocky substrate, so none of the carbon that they um, create and lose is actually really sequestered within their, their habitat. So it's much harder to, to calculate how much carbon is being stored from these habitats. But when you consider that they cover 25% of coastal oceans, um, when you consider that they're um, as productive as other marine vegetated habitats, and when you actually look at the amount of um, car carbon that they produce and lose, um, is it's highly likely um, that kelp do play some role in carbon sequestration and therefore an important role in climate mitigation. And it's been estimated that protecting um, blue carbon, uh, blue and green carbon stores could provide 25% of the emission reductions needed to keep um, global um, CO2 levels to 450 parts per thousand million, sorry. Um, of course, by um, protecting and restoring these habitats, not only are you um, having a, a positive impact on, on perhaps the climate, but also um, you're having positive effects on biodiversity. These um, habitats are important in coastal defense, um, and they also pr provide food um, security for a wide, wide range of populations. So in terms of climate mitigation, we need to reduce black and brown carbon 
and we need to protect and restore blue and green, uh, blue, green and blue carbon. Um, and, and Dan um, mentioned at the very beginning that kelp are actually very good at converting carbon dioxide into biomass. So Macrocystis pyrifera, the giant kelp, can grow up to 60 centimetres to, per day. Um, the main kelp in, in Europe, in the United Kingdom, Laminaria hyperborea, can grow about two centimetres per week. And they have this sort of conveyor belt growth um, way, uh, way of growth. So they have a, their growing area is called the meristem here. And so this is the youngest part of the plant. And this is the oldest part of the plant. And they just go through this conveyor belt. So the, the, the distal end is eroding the whole time. This material is released as dissolved and particular organic matter. Kelps grow on exposed coastline. So they're quite often um, ripped up by storms. In fact, um, I need to go up to the Farne Islands to do some work because some images that were posted on Twitter by some divers showed that the kelp forest around um, the Farns was pretty much decimated um, by Storm Arwen um, back in um, November or December or whenever it was. So this particular organic matter um, can remain in situ and provide important um, food for organisms within the kelp forest, such as these mussels but it can also be moved to off, uh, away from the kelp forest into other environments. So very little of um, the live kelp material is actually um, consumed. Um, urchins can be important um, consumers of kelp, but not so much in the United Kingdom. Um, it's mainly things like the blue ray limpet here, Patella pellucida, um, or Lacuna vincta that may um, graze kelp, uh, the kelp in situ. Um, most of the kelp um, enters detrital pathways. So we can see here, this is um, detrital production for kelp, seagrass, salt marsh and mangroves. And, and we can see that actually generally they, they support similar amounts of detrital production, although salt marsh is greater. But about 80% of that kelp um, detrital uh, pro kelp productivity enters det detrital pathways, again, similar to salt, salt, salt marsh and seagrass, but much, much less than um, mangroves. Some of that is consumed by a suite of grazers and detritivores. Some of that is exported to other hab habitats. So um, this is kelp um, deposited onto the Northumberland coastline um, after a storm, and that's my dog sphagnum um, acting as scale. And some of it can be exported to offshore sediments where potentially um, it could be sequestered for long time periods. Um, and so this is a fish box um, of kelp that was trawled up from about 400 metres off the Scottish coastline um, by Mike Burrows a few years ago, I think. So one of the questions that we wanted to ask as part of the research that um, Dan and I was doing um, along with our research groups was how much carbon is assimilated and transferred through UK kelp forests and what environmental factors influence rates of biomass accumulation and release. So to do this, we took more than 800 quadrat samples. We measured um, more than 3000 kelp to get biomass values. And this gave us an understanding of the um, carbon standing stock. We hole punched, tagged um, and collected and measured um, for greater than 400 plants. which gave us a measure of, of growth and, and, and erosion. We tagged over a thousand um, kelp plants to look at rates of dislodgement. And then we also collected more than 100 detritus samples to quantify the amount of detritus um, within kelp forests and outside of kelp forests, um, which took us on lots of strip trips for over many years um, up to some of the best parts in the United Kingdom. As a function of that, we were able to um, see that um, the sort of northern cooler areas had a higher um, total carbon um, standing stock um, than sort of West Wales and Southwest England. And this was likely driven by the relatively um, cool, clear waters that you find um, in North and Western Scotland. Um, we can see here that actually, you know, you've got more than double the standing stock in these cold regions compared to these warm regions. Um, this is a laminaria hyperborea forest um, off, off Warbeth in Orkney in an incredibly low tide. I think it was a, a minus tide. And this is just extending out um, over hundreds of metres, so quite an extensive um, and, and, and amazing to see it all exposed to air. Um, we talked about um, the loss of kelp and, they, and, and laminaria hyperborea loses, um, loses biomass or, or, um, via three functions. 
by erosion from the distal end, by whole plant loss via dislodgement, and by what we call the May cast. Um, this is the old lamina from the, the previous year. They grow a new lamina. They then um, create this sort of thinning and through the wave action, that's old lamina oh, is lost. Um, and what we were able to show is that the total carbon flux as detritus is negatively related to um, water. So we can see total detrit detritus um, loss um, is greatest in the cold locations and, and least in the warm locations. And we can see that actually it's over double, um, it double the amount of carbon um, is released from these cold regions compared to these warm regions. And so as a function um, of this is that we can perhaps predict as sea temperatures increase, the carbon held and released by kelp forest is likely to decline. We also wanted to compare the, the sort of standing stock of carbon in um, not just um, marine habitats, but also um, European terrestrial habitats. So what we can see here is that actually very little um, carbon um, is, is held in, in laminaria hyperborea forests. Um, the light blue is in living material, the dark blue is in the soils, so obviously there's none, no soils in kelp. Um, so we can see for all of these other um, habitats, um, European habitats, is that the actual carbon standing stock um, is much higher from an awful lot of species, species in living material, but um, much, much higher in, in soils. But when you actually look at the amount of carbon that, that flows out of these systems, you can see that the kelp forests are actually um, producing um, as much carbon or, or nearly as much carbon as tidal marshes and more than these other European habitats put together. So at present, um, kelp carbon isn't included in biogeochemical bioge models um, or in management strategies. Um, and there probably are reasons behind that and, and, and we really need to, to understand some of this a, a hell of a lot better. So it's fairly easy to measure, um, you know, how kelp turns that, um, that, that carbon it gets from um, the seawater in, into um, a biomass. We can also relatively easy measure how much of that material is lost, but it's much harder to work out the fate of that material. Um, so some work that we did um, sort of looked at the amount of detritus within the kelp forest itself, adjacent to kelp forest, to work out how much of that detritus was potentially um, taken offshore. And what we calculated is about 94% of that detritus was um, exported off these subtidal reefs. But the big unknown is what happens to that material. Is it rapidly remineralized and that's uh, that carbon released back into the water column? Is some, how much of it is deposited in coastal habitats, um, moved offshore, buried into um, sediments, um, it, both in the deep and shallow or consumed by detritivores? So these are some of the questions that we need to answer in order to really quantify the role that kelp may play in um, natural sequestration. There is emergent evidence um, from stable isotopes um, and e, e and e DNA and others that kelp carbon does reside in carbon storage habitats, e, for example, offshore sediments or seagrass meadows. So while we don't know the numbers um, around it, it is likely that um, kelp is an important donor um, to, to these um, habitats and therefore plays a blue carbon role. However, you know, there's still so much that needs to be known in this area. And, and I think that we're quite often seeing now um, people running before they were walking, particularly in terms of um, perhaps uh, companies that are setting themselves up um, to, to, to sell carbon offsets. And we need to be very careful here. So the often cited value that 15% of kelp carbon is sequestered in long-term sinks is just based on just four empirical studies. So more work needs to be done there. Also, the amount of carbon sequestered is likely to be highly context dependent based on species, consumption rates, near it, uh, uh, distance to potential sinks, ocean currents, um, for example. Um, we also have to remember that seaweed habitats can be heterotrophic because um, of res respiration by microbes, plants and animals. So they could be actually carbon sources. But you'd have to say that would be the case for other um, marine, vegetated and terrestrial habitats but perhaps more, some of these systems are more heterotrophic than others. So there's much work to be done um, in, 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 in this area. 
Um, but it is an area that there's increasing interest in and, and we need to do more work on it. And indeed, as John said at the very beginning when he was introducing us, um, Dan and I um, met when we were postdocing in Western Australia and decided that we liked drinking together. Um, and therefore, perhaps it would be good to create, co collaborate um, scientifically. And we came, when we got back to the, the UK, we sat down and we both had done a lot of um, subtitle research in Western Australia, done work on kelps and seagrass meadows. And we wanted to actually, you know, re-energize that work um, in, on kelp forests in the United Kingdom. You know, we'd been a world leader in this area for quite a long time in, up until the 60s. And at that point in time, no one was really doing very much work. Um, but what we can see now is that kelp is um, on, on the lips of everyone. Um, a few years ago, there was um, a proposal to, to um, start kelp dredging um, in, in, in Scotland, and that led to a ferocious backlab, backlash from um, local residents. Um, the Sussex kelp um, project has um, garnered a huge amount of interest interest, including David Attenborough's support. Um, you're seeing more and more people talking about seaweed kelp aquaculture, wild harvesting, restoring and protecting these systems. They're really, um, we're, we're really opening the lid on what I believe are these truly iconic systems. So just to summarize, um, kelp forests are widespread both globally and around the UK and Ireland. They support really high biodiversity and provide a range of ecosystem um, services, but are largely understudied. Um, the capture and flow of carbon through kelp forests is um, significant, but the fate of this carbon is poorly known. Um, kelp and kelp forest distribution structure and functioning is affected by environmental change, um, but the wider implications remain unclear. And on, to end on a more positive note, we're seeing much more increased awareness, improved management and conservation, and also successful rest, restoration activities. So perhaps this gives us a cause for optimism um, and, and sort of a rally cry to, to, to protect um, um, these really critical environments. On that note, um, I'd like to stop. Um, and as with any research, none of this would have been possible without um, a, a huge team um, and I, I don't know how many PhD students have been part of um, Tea Kelp UK, um, but a, a wide number, research assistants, um, postdocs, um, the, the scientific, uh, the NERC National Facility for Scientific Diving supported a lot of our work um, and our funders. Um, and this is dad, uh, Dan's a dad, so this is his favourite joke. Um, why did the fish conf confess it was hooked on seaweed? Um, it was a cry for kelp. Um, and that is where I will finish. Thank you very much, um, Dan and Pip. That was, yeah, that was really informative and took on a much greater geographic scope than I'd anticipated. So it was really interesting to see all the stories from around the world. Um, I know that, Dan, that you've been answering questions that have been open. That's been really good. Um, so I think what we're going to do now is, um, is close the meeting and, and uh, right now and, and say goodbye to everybody, um, unless there are any other pressing questions which are actually coming up. There are a few new questions popping up. So what we could do is just keep it open while, um, if that's okay, to, to continue just answering these for a couple of minutes. Um, that'd be great. But thank you everybody. If you haven't got further questions, then um, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, hey John, yeah, I think there's just a couple that I didn't get around to answering uh, by text. So Fiona asked um, uh, what uh, mine and Pip's opinion was on cultivating seaweed to utilize for biomass for industry, industrial applications. Um, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, I think that seaweed cultivation, as there's been a lot of talks over the last couple of days about seaweed cultivation and, you know, the issues around that and also the opportunities. Um, so I think if it's done sustainably, like you can obviously cultivate a lot of biomass for industrial use, but there are issues and it needs to be done sustainably um, and in the right way, in the right place. I don't know, Pip, if you've got anything to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I again, I mean, in terms of, I guess, 
neither neither Dan nor I are, are sort of biorefining people, so we can more talk about the impacts of the aquaculture, seaweed farming itself. And yeah, I mean, as long as it doesn't have um, environmental impacts, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, my understanding behind the sort of um, sort of industry application for a lot of kelp. Um, or, or macroalgae in general is it, it's still very much at the experimental scale and 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 the sort of scaling up is still perhaps part of an issue but no I mean if it can be made to be cost effective then yeah go for it um did you see that quite a fun question really um what are the best places to dive a kelp forest in the UK and specifically in Wales I think over the field work that Pip and I have done, um, the place that we always like to go and do field work and dive is around the Orkney Isles in North Scotland, just because the visibility is always, well, pretty much always really, really good. And the kelps are just massive and the forests are so extensive. It really feels like you're in sort of different, different worlds, you know, like walking through a massive oak forest on land or something. So we, on, during our field trips, we always like to go to Orkney. Um, I'm going to pass over about the Welsh situation to Pip because we only ever dived in Pembrokeshire and it was always pretty turbid, but there must be, I know there's some amazing places elsewhere. So I, I think I've just put up um, an, an image and that this is um, one of our favourite dive sites in Orkney. So this is um, Nipple Rock, um, which is off the west coast of um, Hoy. Um, it's, I think the top of it's about 17 metres, is it, Dan? And then it then it drops down from there. Um, but you can just see, I mean, it's just amazing with all of these um, dead man's fingers and laminaria hyperborea. You can see um, saith swimming around, big saith swimming around up here. And the the colours are just stunning. I mean, I I think um, I think the the the, the diving um, in kelp forests in, in in the UK and elsewhere is some of the best diving in the world. Um, in terms of Wales, yeah, we did we did. Pembrokeshire is a good place to, to dive, but the sites that we had were pretty turbid. Um, also around um, Anglesey and the Clean Peninsula um, are good diving um, places as well. I hope that helps. Yeah, we've got lots of other questions coming in. Um, uh, we might have to um, just answer a couple more of them because I'm mindful that you, you probably have places to go as well. Um, the one that I'm seeing at the bottom, what do you think the significant impacts of marine heat waves will be on kelp aqua farms around the UK? Um, yeah, I think I think the most the most important uh, aspect of ocean warming and and kelp farms in the UK is to think about future proofing which species are being farmed. Uh, for example, at the minute, there's a lot of um, Alaria escalenta farming or some farming done in Scotland, but, and there's talk of doing it in southwest England around Cornwall. But within the next you know, decade or two, summer temperatures are going to be really stressful for Alaria and spring temperatures. So you wouldn't maybe choose that uh, as your sort of like warm adapted productive species for farming. So maybe I think the big thing will be species selection and even population selection. Uh, to make sure that the, whatever you're cultivating can deal with the increasing the currents of marine heat waves um, and just general warming as well. There's, there's been some interesting work um, in, in Tasmania where they, not, this hasn't been from a farming perspective, um, but actually been looking um, at uh, uh, genotypes within the same populations that are perhaps more heat tolerant than, than um, other, others within the population. And they found that actually within the same location that you will have individuals that are more heat tolerant and then they're doing work on culturing those and they're actually using that for restoration efforts and um, where the giant kelp has disappeared because of the real rapid warming of, of the East Australia current. So I think um, looking at, um, you know, um, culturing more warm adapted species as well as looking to, to do work where you're perhaps looking at um, uh, far farming species that are more warm tolerant is probably something we will need to do into the future. Um, I should ask Dan and Pippa, are you comfortable to, to stay on and all for a couple more minutes or would you like to put a limit on the number of additional questions that you're able to answer? I'm happy, I've just opened another can of beer. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. I think there's an interesting one here from Vicky. He says, do you think it would be possible to quantify flows or stocks of kelp-derived carbon and sediment using e.g. eDNA? So as it happened, as it happens, um, yeah, we've just got a new project up actually funded by the WWF, which is doing exactly that around kelp farms um, in the UK. So the idea is that you can cause sediments uh, adjacent to either natural beds or farm kelps, uh, and then use traditional like stabilized isotope techniques and carbon techniques, but also um, use more molecular techniques, eDNA, to work out where that carbon's actually coming from, to try and work out whether it's phytoplankton derived or other macroalgae derived or coming from those from the kelp farm. Because there's been a lot of talk about how kelp farms uh, have this sort of indirect benefit of potentially increasing carbon sequestration in the sediments nearby, but there's very limited evidence for that, very few data sets. So one of the things we're going to do over the next few years is to take those calls and work with biogeochemists and molecular biologists to, to see where that carbon's coming from. I think that's a really big question generally in, in sort of like uh, blue carbon and kelp is that seascape approach to understand carbon connectivity. Yeah, so watch this space then. Um, I, I can take on, oh, sorry, John, you-, you... No, go on, Pip. I was just gonna say, I can take on two questions that are, are, are related. So there's one saying, what do you see as the biggest challenge for kelp restoration currently? Um, and, and I would say that that's scaling up. Um, uh, you know, nearly all the studies that have been published have been done, very much done at the experimental scale. Um, so it really is actually then scaling that up. So you're, you're restoring um, kelp forests rather than kelp individuals. Um, and, you know, I think the, the Operation Crayweed example is a really nice example, um, but they've been so successful, not necessarily um, from the well, it is through the direct transplantation, but it's almost the, the unanticipated fact that that, that led to um, uh, increased re uh, re reproduction and then, and then recruitment. Um, that might not always be the case for all the kelps that are translated. Um, and someone, uh, Gary Ritson said, um, which man management strategies would you personally recommend and why? And I'm guessing that's in terms of the different um, restoration techniques um, and I guess I guess the answer to that is probably context dependent um, so you, you know um, particularly in the United Kingdom we're not keen on necessarily putting in artificial reefs where they're not required um, so we probably wouldn't be looking in the UK to be seeding um, artificial structures but at the same point in time, um, we are seeing increasing levels of coastal defence and, and, and you could argue that seeding those with kelp not only um, could um, be good for the kelp, but it actually could also um, increase the sort of um, coastal protection role um, that is created as well through the, the buffering of the wave action. Um, in terms of transplanting um, individuals, you've got to be sure that you're not actually causing damage to the source population by moving them. Um, so I, I sort of think it's probably quite context dependent. The one that probably looks the least potentially damaging, such as looking at seeding, um, uh, is, is perhaps um, one that probably may have less success in some respects. Brilliant. Um, thanks very much. Um, Pip and Dan for answering these questions. And I do apologize to those people who have posted questions that we haven't had a chance to get around to. Um, your engagement is very much appreciated, but um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, all, uh, all that remains to be said is uh, thanks again um, to Pippa and Dan and yeah, look, really looking forward to seeing the next kind of generation of your research, which you've given us some hints as to, as to what to expect. So fantastic. Thanks very much, everybody, for attending and um, take care. Thanks. <laughs>